conversations with creative people. Tonight, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to do a studio tour with artist Michael Rohner. If you've seen episode seven, then you've met Michael, but you haven't seen his studio before. If this is your first time watching, I'm your host, Ann Kelly. You might be wondering who I am. In a nutshell, I'm someone that's been in love with art and music basically my entire life. I've now been working in the professional gallery world for about 15 years now. About halfway through 2020, I decided to start Art in the Raw as a way to keep people connected and inspired. If you see value in that, please do me a solid and subscribe and tell your friends. If you'd like to know a little bit more, take a look at the description below. But in the meantime, I'm excited to take you on a little trip to Michael Rohner's studio. Cheers. Do they know what we're doing? It's episode 40. It's episode 40. And we agreed, we agreed a long time ago <laughs> to get 40s. On episode seven. Wow, you've come a long way. And I kind of improvised. This is actually a very large bottle of cider. Mm -hmm. Not of a 40, but it's green. Like your Mickey's? Right, yeah. So I have a Mickey's from Milwaukee and you have a cider from France. I think we're, yes. we're operating on different levels here. But they're both big green bottles. <laughs> they're both big green bottles and we'll have a great time. We'll take you through this studio behind me that we're in. Here, are you still living by the train tracks? I am. Kind of hoping for a train tonight. Me too. 6.55 my time over here. So this is good train time. People are commuting. This might be our lucky, lucky number 40. So in terms of things picking up, you normally do a lot of art fairs and, and that's happening again. They are happening. A lot of the big art shows, especially in the area have been scaled back for the time being. I'm in Berkeley, Bay Area, California. The DIY thing out here, like in at Lake Merritt in Oakland, there are loads of vendors dotting the, the lake. And I haven't done any of those, but people who are out there to get it are getting it. People have new homes they need to fill. People have third and fourth homes. Oh, here we go. Our, we got the train. We got the train. Yay. Right after talking about it. That's what they sound like. That actually wasn't a bad one. Some of them are really uh, intrusive. You've done a fair recently. Carefree Arizona in March. It was an interesting experience. It was certainly different. I mean, we've all been changed. So there were some people you could tell hadn't connected with people in a really long time. You could tell people were either lonely or excited. You know, I, I've noticed that in general for a while, people's kind of like social game was a little bit off, like that muscle had kind of atrophied a little bit. So right. a lot of like awkward conversations that were kind of cute and endearing. You also had people that were out just, they wanted to buy stuff. They wanted to spend money. They wanted to be back into feeling the way they felt. So I've also found this past year has been actually a pretty good year for, for artists. So they just jump in there and- mm -hmm work on some new pieces that's yes that's you yeah I, I think we might have talked about this last time or was i working on it the wolf and and Ra raven piece we were finishing it yeah that was a new experience for me i'm used to working on a tight deadline and kind of having to finish create and finish my work in between art shows you know i'd often be home for two weeks or three weeks tops before i have to turn back around and it's not like i get to create art during that entire two or three week period you know there's laundry and groceries and all that stuff so I've never really had a chance to just do a long form piece of artwork the way I did during COVID and it was nice to just let a piece breathe as much as it needed to breathe and I think it was better for it I'm also finding that without the pressure to constantly be producing I'm I want to make sure I say this in the right way because you know, I've been hard on myself feeling like I should be more productive or more prolific but I'm realizing like the creative process isn't just output, right? I mean, there's also experiences. There's also just my own personal journey, contemplation. You know, I've gone camping a handful of times recently, and that was just as important as being at my drawing table, be out there without reception, thinking, taking things in, experiencing things that kind of shift my perspective on life. 
I thought I would have produced more work by now, but I'm actually much happier with what I have produced. You don't have that fast track deadline. And, and I think it's really helpful to be able to sit with a piece for a while. Mm -hmm. Well, and you, for, for those that haven't seen episode seven, you sell your originals, but you also have prints as well. Part of that is the originals you want to spend a lot of time on, but you have yes. even, even a little more time had that, that luxury. It's a really good point you bring up. I think in general, I was always craving and pushing towards that direction. And maybe wasn't even fully aware of how much it was that, st- that was still constrained by my kind of rigorous schedule that I had. With the luxury of reflection during this you know, last year, year and a half, I was thinking about you know, looking over my portfolio and, and the kind of the completed, you know, pieces that I'm currently in, that are too. my pieces that are currently in rotation. I think the ones that I was happiest with are the ones that took me the longest. Like I would start, run out of time, decide I wouldn't finish it before a show, go on the road, come back, work on it, rinse and repeat. Some of the creative process for those pieces was actually really stressful for me thinking I wasn't working fast enough or you know I was falling behind or whatnot but my the work was better for actually dipping in a way dipping my toes in and out thinking of the bear cub that I did called milk and honey I was trying to get it done before one of my road schedules and didn't and I came to an important like creative crossroads on that piece like there was a branch at a bottom that the bear was sitting on and I, I didn't want to draw it like a real branch I wanted to put a, a pattern in there and had no idea what kind of pattern I wanted ran out of time then I kind of decided okay if while I'm on the road maybe the right pattern will come to me and it did like maybe a month into my road trip I came across a friend of mine his name was Ben passed away a year prior to that he was from Kenya and his mom had flown into Ken- flown in from Kenya to visit Ben's widow and her grandchildren long story short she brought this tapestries and one of them was just perfect so I got to like snap some photos of that it incorporated into the piece the piece ended up tying into his story getting a partial tribute to him and that wouldn't have happened if I had finished that piece in one clip and it's been a nice really important revelation for me to like put less pressure on myself to to rush create on an artificially imposed timeline because sometimes these things need as long as they need to breathe you know sometimes maybe it's better just to step away from a piece start on something else you know, let it come back to it when it's, when the, you know, the muses are kind of speaking to it. You know, it was a very long-winded answer, but. In the end of the day, you, you are an artist and you don't have a boss other than yourself. That, that piece wouldn't have that power had that story not been a no. part of the piece. I've been doing this for maybe between 10 and 11 years now. now. I sometimes forget that in terms of going to an art show, if I needed to, I can lean back on my portfolio. So sometimes even if I don't feel like I've made something new, if I haven't been to Dallas in a year and I go back, what I've created over the last year is new to them. You know, you look at your, like my square credit card report. And every time I do a show, you have like a really small percentage of those credit card sales are from repeat customers. You have your regulars, but you know, when I'm actually looking at the hard data, 95 plus percent people are buying from me for the first time. So it's all new to them. So this idea that I have to do something new each time I get out there is really artificially imposed and I would even say maybe even like a self-worth thing like I'm not good enough unless I'm constantly pushing something new you know and not thinking that what, what's what's already been created is enough to satisfy my salary requirements. So that makes me wonder in the past have you worked on multiple pieces at the same time? I've done it both ways I'm probably better for it when I'm working on multiple pieces I mean sometimes what I'm working on like some of these pieces behind me tend to be so intricate and so large that I we don't move the paper out of the way and put something else on the table, but I should. Then that kind of gives you the freedom to maybe let a piece breathe, but not Mm -hmm. halt. Yes. uh, Progress. It's fun to work on different scales too. I like working on say big and small at the same time, or if something is really intricate with detail, like just constant line work, then I'll move on a a little bit more of a free flowing loose piece just to kind of break up that monotony or rhythm. So speaking of all of this, you mentioned you would give us a little insight into your studio. Oh yeah. Okay. What are you working on now? I'm working on a couple of crows right now. Long story short, found a litlin that was separated from its parents and I'm going to try to bring it to the animal shelter and didn't make it. We weren't supposed to name him, but I just kind of naturally started calling it Dexter. 
And so it made it a lot harder when Dexter didn't make it. And so I've been drawing some crows, some crow fledglings to our, the point of what we were saying, I'm actually working on a much bigger diptych right now. And then immediately took a break from that and started working on some crows. I think I saw a, a crow sketch yes. on Instagram the other day. Is that? Yes, that was yeah. it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm stoked. I'm kind of glad you asked to do this. It's going to unplug my mic so I can get mobile with you. And yeah. so I do production back there. Here's the a collection of some of my originals I currently have. And here is where I work. So this is the crow. That I was originally planning on making a really loose sketch, but after like kind of laying it out with the pencil, I just liked the structure of it so much. I decided to get in there with like fine detail. And next thing you know, I'm spending hours on it. Just kind of going over all the little nuances, which any one of these little feathers is a whole little world unto itself when you're uh, etching your little lines and kind of just building the contour and the shape. I like to give each one special attention just to kind of make sure it has that like life and movement and fluidity. How many hours would you guess you have in this drawing so far? It's a good question. I, cause I'd break it up, but I'm saying maybe now four or five. Um, and it's not that big. I mean, I would imagine when you're drawing these things, you're just get kind of lost in it. You don't have an actual timer going. Yeah, I've been suggested to do that. I resist it. I don't, I don't like the idea of clocking in and clocking out. I, I do a time-lapse recording of some of my drawings and, and kind of turning the GoPro on and off. I, I would think actually timing yourself would be kind of inhibiting. When I sit down, I'll glance at my watch or glance at the clock real quick. But, you know, you do that enough times and, you know, the hours start to get fuzzy. And real quick, next to it, I did a... I did this one first and it was a very loose kind of more lowbrow style. I was using like dip pens, like old school calligraphy dip pens for this guy. Like here and here and even there is where like some of the pen, the ink leaked. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot messier, a lot less control, completely different style. How would you describe that? Like a little bit more of a, I say lowbrow. The first guy feels a little more surreal to me. This one here. Yeah. The bigger one is more refined. That's kind of my overall preferred style to work in. But I will say this is a little bit more like getting off stuff off my chest. You mm -hmm. know, it's a little bit more free flowing. It might become a piece that I, that I, you know, put out for sale. But, you know, after I had that little experience with Dexter, the, the fledgling, I just needed to kind of just draw something to, to kind of move some things on the inside for me. And then I was like, oh, okay, let's try it again. And then here we are. So. I mean, I kind of love both of them. They just have a different feel to them. Well, thank you. And they're currently I, on the same sheet of paper. Is that yes. something you would normally do? I've started doing that more. I did a series of minis that I could probably pull out. And I was trying something during COVID where I would do like two or three images on one page. And then after that did six five or six on one page and I really liked it I like doing kind of like one background wash for the whole thing and then breaking them up so kind of another a it kind of created a continuity between the pieces but b it just added a different dimension to the background that that was a departure from the normal each individual background for each individual piece sort of thing and when you're talking about the background are you talking about going in with watercolor or something else these days, mostly watercolor. I used to do spray paint backgrounds. I would take, let's see here, we're in the studio, so let's show you. I would spray paint the backgrounds. Let's do some of my bleed sheets. I would have to create a mask. Here's a mask. I'm giving away some of my secrets right here. Copying different parts of a piece and make a complete cover. So you see that piece up there? you know, make a complete cover for whatever character I'm working on and then spray paint, overlay spray paint the background. I would create the character first and then do the background afterwards. You know, gotcha. in the case of spray paint, the spray paint would have to go on last and I started just getting used to working that way. Now I'm switching it up a little more depending on the piece. But yeah, in the case of the wolf, I did the wolf and the raven first and then added the background after that. You managed to work with spray paint in a way that kind of looks like watercolor. Like you bring this lower opacity to it. Um, here's a piece here, an oldie and goodie. It needs to be reframed. The background that you're seeing, the splatter, the kind of sand color in the background, that's all spray paint. And that was all done last. 
Thank you for sharing. You know, you could say, okay, that's a trade secret. Out some key components to that as well. So if anybody's interested, I challenge them to replicate it. <laughs> I want to see it. So what else so is in the studio? This is, I will preface by saying this is a custom piece that I'm doing where the, the, the person I'm doing this for doesn't really know what I'm doing. I got kind of free reign to work on it. So this is technically a surprise. Background you're seeing will be covered with it's gonna be lots of flora. Get number three out of 40 coming down the pipeline. Train line. number three. All Train right. Number three. So how far are you into this piece? Mm, I am, I'd say mostly done with the penciling layout process. You see there's some kind of open areas there and where am I? I think I'm gonna fill in a little bit more here. Just creating the flow all around. And once that's done, then I'll get into inking, which will take me, oh gosh, if I, if I really, dig my heels in I could get the inking done and in, I'd say a week but it might take longer and then and then the the color is usually the fastest part as you saw with the crow when you get into those fine line details it just it can take as long as it takes you can only move so fast just mm -hmm. you know and then this piece is considerably better than bigger than the one below it piece is this a commission yes. Um, yes so two different ways of working you've got your commission piece and then you have the crow mm -hmm. piece which is just yes. needed to be made they definitely scratch different itches i'm i'm very selective about the commission work i take for some of the same reasons we discussed it's important to me to be able to really connect to a piece and and, and enjoy what i'm doing so my work is just better that way. I would argue that most people's would be better that way, but I can only speak for myself. The, the source of where I'm creating from matters a lot. I don't think I can only do it for a payout. There has to be a good synergy between, between the collector and I. The, the muse is important, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. You know, depending on how long I'm working on a piece, I mean, someone could be hiring me for a month of my life some, or longer. You know, what I work on, I really take take it seriously and, and, and it occupies my, my dream space. It kind of operates my imagination space, my like, I, I ruminate on these pieces a lot. And so if someone hires me to do a, a, a piece for them, I'm they're really in a way taking up a chunk of my year. I, I usually don't start working on a piece right away once we commit to working together. I, I let something gestate for weeks, if not months, depending mm -hmm. on the timeline they're asking for. And, and the best work usually isn't on a timeline, right? It's, they just say like, Hey, whenever you can do it. So it, it should be a good fit because we're going to spend a lot of time together. And I could definitely see how you would end up dreaming about pieces you're, you're really focused on. And that makes me wonder, do dreams ever end up actually influencing the final result of the piece? I would say less so sleeping dreams. My dreams are usually pretty boring and my waking imagination is pretty busy. And so when I daydream, or when I'm driving long distances or I go on a lot of hikes, that's where the, the matriculation happens. So it's not all just when you're sitting at your desk, maybe you're no. in the woods and you make that mental note. Oftentimes when I'm at the, the drawing table, I'm thinking about other things. I, I kind of try to, I kind of in a way check out, I like to describe it as like vacating the ego, getting out of the way. Sometimes I would even take a phone call while I'm drawing just so I can kind of have my left brain occupied by different things that my kind of subconscious and, you know, all the muscle memory that's been developed over the years of doing this, you know, we could even say the muses, let them kick in. The thinking about the piece and the meditating on it happens away from it. And so how about some of the materials that you're working with? Here's my caddy. I actually recently just got this. I was, I don't know why I haven't had a caddy all this time. I used to use your regular disposable felt tip pen. Mm -hmm especially since I'm using this really rough, porous watercolor paper, I would just destroy pens. It was not very environmentally friendly to just have a trash can full of empty pens. So I started using these pens with uh, replaceable nibs and replaceable ink. You know, it was pricier upfront to get this more or less permanent pen, but I can always replace the nib. And I have, you know, I have all my spare nibs lined up, so because when I'm working, you know, I could, I could go through, you know, tons of these on any given piece and, you know, running out of ink as well. So yeah, I've, uh, I use these really nice, I don't know, should we name the brand or? Sure, why not? Yeah, 
So I really like using Copic multiliners. You know, the buy-in is, is much higher than these disposable pens, but you know, you get it, you know, essentially you can keep use it for a really long time, if not life. I don't know. They they haven't gone out on me. I used to use this pen and I loved it. It was a Japanese calligraphy pen mm. with a soft tip. It's called a Fude pen. And I used to only be able to get this specific pen from a small little Japanese stationery store in, in downtown LA and Japantown. These lines that you can create with it, like, you know, depending on your touch, you know, you can kind of make it do whatever you want. I mean, as thick as that, and let's see, and as thin as, hard to hold the camera and do this but you can get some oh i'm using some really this is like computer paper here so it's going to bleed but if i'm using like thicker paper i can give a super thin line so you could kind of do an entire piece with just this pen when you get used to it that first raven you had done with a more of a fountain no um a calligraphy dip pen yes i i yeah. used to have a few of those and even if you're just writing it's just kind of an amazing experience it really is i highly recommend it I mean, there's a lot of room for error with them because they, as we saw here, they tend to leak and all this splatter was, that was not intentional. I mean, I, I use it because I like that splatter, but that's just where, you know, if the, if the tip gets kind of stuck in the paper for a second and then unjams, like the ink that's sitting on the tip will just flick. That's where you're getting the happy accidents like you would get yeah. some of the early analog photography processes. Yeah, that's what's that's what's great about the the analog photography. And I remembered you in episode with Ty talking about the grainier, less polished film qualities are almost even in vogue right now, right? Absolutely. And yeah, it's just kind of so fun. It it is fun. So that point, I was planning on doing that with this piece and just being really loose and free. Trade off would have been I wouldn't have had any of the precision that I have with this, and it wouldn't be as tight. And that's kind of what I craved here, but. When the mood calls for it, I, I love using those those pens. Um, I've only found that, like, I think it's the Dick Blick brand. I think it's like Black Cat Ink or something like that. They, they're they waterproof. And that brings me back to this pen. I was The last thing I was going to say about it is I, I stopped using it because they don't make, it has their own, like, proprietary ink cartridges, and they're not waterproof, so can't use watercolors with them. I like to draw with mechanical pencils. Here's a, a 0.3, but I usually use a 0.5 use all kinds of different pencils. I even use sometimes with like blue lead. There's blue lead in this guy, I believe, right? What does that look like? It's actually like blue lead, like you. Yeah, and that's what I was using for this piece as well. When I'm laying something down, the blue lead is easier for me to see. Or sometimes I use it to distinguish areas that I wanna focus on when I'm inking. I have loads of other drawing utensils, but but this is what I really like working with. So this is like my active, my active tool role. So you mentioned you didn't have the material cart until kind of recently. What inspired to set that up? I'd seen other artists using this specific cart, this little like Ikea cart. I thought I had way more materials than would fit on there. So I was using this much bigger cart over here. And, you know, I had like all my pens laid out in these drawers, taking up a lot of space, but Oh yeah, here's more of my pens and colored pencils and squeegees from when I screen printed. But this this guy just took up so much space over here. It was kind of just ergonomically a pain in the butt to, to navigate around. And so I just wanted something a little smaller and more modular. I, I keep the stuff that I most actively use on there and then less frequently accessed over there. Kind of like being a mechanic. You wanna be able to get to those tools. Yes, and then get them out of the way as, you know, as fast as they were there, because sometimes you just need space to work with. I like working at this table, and you see my speakers up there, I usually have music, if not blasting, pretty loud, and I like to be able to move, take a step back, dance while I'm working or anything, just to kind of, because it's a whole body experience when I'm, when I'm going for it. So most of the stuff in here at this point is on wheels, on mm -hmm. casters, because I really like stuff being modular. I like being able to move, create more space when I need it reconfigure when I need it. Maybe you decide to bust out a 40 by 60 piece and you could make that happen. I could put my tables together, like red can be more of an aggressive color for people and, you know, puts them in a different state than say a blue does. 
you know, they say some colors do have universal, you know, frequencies or properties to them, but also, you know, we each gravitate towards something. And if you can surround yourself with things that bring better qualities out of you and put you in a better state of mind. Would you say there's certain colors or color combinations that you know, just naturally gravitate to? Together, here's a wall of art that I've collected from other people. I mean, if you notice all that blue, mm -hmm. like that turquoise that kind of seems to run through everything. I didn't plan that. You know, I, I naturally gravitated towards that and other people's work. And I, I tend to use a lot of that blue as well. I've, I've heard some artists say that, that they naturally tend to want to use certain colors and sometimes force themselves to use kind of the opposite end of the spectrum of colors. I've heard that. And, you know, you see painters working, you know, trying to give themselves certain palettes to work within. I mean, I think I work with a, I'll show you what my palette currently is. Here's the, you know, my palette at the moment. And I think I actually tend to like to work on the outsides, you know, the, 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 the sepia, the black, you know, these umbers, as well as I think, and then I move into like the raw umber. I use those colors a lot. That mm -hmm. seem to be the foundation of my work. And then I like to kind of make them pop with something along this end. It tends to be often kind of an intuitive process for me. Like I, I didn't study color theory and I don't think I really have a, a verbal a, a good way to verbally communicate my color language but I feel like with each piece color formula for lack of better words tends to kind of I oftentimes go into a piece without seeing a color for it and then as I work on and as I'm working on the lines like colors start to kind of bubble to the surface that I want to use as the foundation and and the combination so I'm not sure if I'd say there's a go-to color combination that I work with but looking at my own work, I seem to like a lot of violets, blues, and then the, the umbers. So the, the crow, for example, color to be determined. That one is clear to me. The, you know, the fledglings have those really bright blue eyes, kind of like the, the White Walkers and Game of Thrones. You now you're going to have the, the spectrum of the darks and the blacks, the deep, deep blacks for the body and then the bright blue eyes. I think I might do another pattern sort of thing in the branch cement gray with like a hint of blue color in the background and then a couple of accoutrements there, there will be some gold in this as well so so that color palette is pretty determined this custom piece there's actually a lot of colors in the the flowers that are going on to it and then the, these are dogs both of them have a, a pretty have some like light cream colored coats and mm -hmm. so I have some ideas of what color scheme I'm going to use to tie it all together but I think I'm going to have to lay it down first like the dogs and the flowers before knowing if those color ideas and choices that I had made will work. The time I'm editing this video, pieces of art will look different. Maybe when we get closer to that, you can send me updated versions. So, so while you're still unwired, you had started mm -hmm. to show us some art that you've collected. Can we get a closer look at some of that art? And asking about what people are collecting. So here it is. This kind of uh, an eclectic, combination of pieces I've collected from artists that I personally know or that I've come across. This deer right here is from a painter named Matt Robertson. My, my partner Tara and I, when we first moved back to the Bay, we were bending at a first Friday and I met him. Turns out he had a studio in the studio building I worked in. Loved his work. I think he moved to uh, Baltimore to, to work on an MFA and he had a far more advanced um, academic background in the arts than I do. So if I was ever stuck with an art problem, he was like, always there in a pinch to kind of get me through it. So this piece of his, just, I love I love the way he mixed his photorealism in with the geometric blocking. Matt Robertson, I think his handle is at Matt Robertson Art and he is a beast. I will look him up. We call her the pouty gal. This guy, Shane Heath is, he's awesome. I met him at a festival in Santa Cruz at the Capitola Art and Wine Festival. His booth was next to mine, just loved this combination of, of completely interpretive, loose, fun, kind of like, you know what I was showing you with one of those, those crows back there, just like a very free, loose style with very realistic underpainting of the face. And then he just, he's, he was such a free artist. I really admired and, and just kind of really dug how free he was to, to make something, you know, have photorealistic elements in his, in his work or some pretty strongly figurative elements in his work with just like this freedom to like go crazy and have fun. I think he went off and started himself a, a drink called Mud Water. It's like a coffee alternative, and it sounds like that's taken off right now. So wow. every once in a while, I see ads with the painter Shane 
talking to my Instagram, like promoted ads of his mud water that he's putting out there. So it's multifaceted, multi-talented gentleman. He doesn't seem confined to uh, one world. I love these guys, the Black Ink Art Brothers, Dave and uh, John Schwartz. Mm -hmm. They work together on their paintings and they don't tell people who does what. I think if you follow like their individual accounts, then you'll see what they're posting that they individually worked on. But when you see them out together, they just have a collection of work with this really cool, loose, exciting kind of bold, striking style that, you know, I think if you really dial into who they are, you might be able to distinguish which brother did which parts, but I just, I love the mystery of it all. It's, you know, so many of their pieces are just like out of a dream. I forgot what they called this piece, but I, I just get so happy every time I see it. And it makes so much sense. The jellyfish, absolutely, right? I, I don't see any yeah. problem with the jellyfish circling the cat in the moon. Maybe if you just wrote that down on a piece of paper and I read it, I would be kind of confused. But yeah, in looking at it, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, if you wrote it down on paper, you'd be confused. And then he'd show it to you and you'd be like, oh, that's what you meant. Yeah, exactly. So they're all good. One, one of the beauties of the visual image. And we've got some Freddie Mercury. We have some tiles from my good friend, Cassidy Watt. You know, he's actually out there in Santa Fe with you. And he does his, these beautiful remnant totems. With, he does his own proprietary patinas on these, these pieces of metal and combines them. Have you seen them? Have you seen his work? I don't think I have. He had a gallery in Madrid for many years, Metallo Gallery. And then he's since moved on from that and moved to Santa Fe. And he shows his works in some galleries up there. And I love these totems. And they just, they, you know, you can collect them. Bump, 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 bump. This is what I have in the studio. We have more work upstairs. We live upstairs. This is a live work place, but uh, kind of ended up being my electric wall. And, well, and um, I like how well it just kind of almost just integrates with your, your dry erase board as well. It's yes. Like yeah, you well, wouldn't think that would work, but it just, yeah, it all. Does it just tie the, the, the dry erase board pulls it all together? Oh yes, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then the hat wall. Oh, I love this piece right here too. Is there resin on that? It's glass. Mm. So it's a slice of a tree trunk that was hollowed out. And those are all real butterflies and real flowers. But yeah, it's just a glass cover for it. So, so like while that. you're still roaming around the studio, yeah, you have some totem pieces that are mounted on wood. Do you have any of those? The mini totems I was referring to, they're in a bin, so I'll need to fish them out, but... Bear with me, everybody. Here are my organization shelves. So. What do we have here? Yep. So here's one. It's a little five by seven original mini totem. This one's called Meow. And so when you go out to fairs, you have a whole wide range of originals and these little mounted pieces, but they can all be found on your website too. They could all be found on my website with ownerart.com under the mini totem section. You find these little mini originals. Not everybody has the room. So we have these mini totem originals. Here's a jackrabbit. Well, and sometimes mini pieces are just kind of sweet to have. Oh yeah. I mean, you see, I have a collection of minis up on my wall from other people too. It's a nice, easy, it's a nice, easy way to access someone's work and, and start your collection of originals. But even with these little guys, this one right here is four inches by nine inches. And, you know, I really got in there with the details. It's beautiful. Thank you. There's one I wanted to pull out. There's a sloth. I like this one. These tend to go pretty fast. So if you like one, I would say grab it. And they're all well organized and cared for. They're all bubble wrapped and well protected. So you mentioned you had been jamming out while, while painting recently. Mm -hmm. Any favorite music? My go-tos always are Blue Sky, Black Death. He described them kind of an electronic hip hop beat duo who since disbanded, I believe, one half of them maybe got out of the music game altogether, but you know, they have a pretty strong catalog of music that for whatever reason, if I'm not dialing in, 
put their music on and just like that I'm zoned in and one of the remaining members who still makes music who's still constantly putting out music he's actually based nearby here in Oakland goes by the name Tell of Angel to his modern work some of it's a little bit slower can still work to it but for the most part their kind of BPM range is really good to get me moving into the music I don't think I'm the only person that has this relationship with them but their music just can really put you in that in that right vibrational state similar but different would be someone like Emancipator so I like to listen to music without words a lot of the time when I'm working just to kind of so that the words don't inform what I'm thinking otherwise you know sometimes I'll just throw on with like my Spotify discover weekly playlist I get, I, I get in these moods you know sometimes I'll just be listening to blues I'll kind of put it on a random blues radio playlist or I've been on a Frank Ocean kick lately do you listen to Frank Ocean I'm not familiar but I'll yeah I'll yeah, Frank Ocean's wonderful. Such a creative singer, creative spirit, sensitive, delicate spirit. And that all comes across in his music. You know, I like listening to vulnerable music. People, you know, when you listen to Blue Sky, Black Death, there's a, it's kind of a bittersweet sentiment that comes out. When I'm, and and there's, there is a human vulnerability in there as well. And I think a lot of that type of quality really is good for me to work around. You know, mm -hmm. kind of, kind of cracks open that, that barrier that we may have when we're trying to access our, our deeper creative selves, you know, without judgment, without the ego getting in the way. The, the muse. Train four. Is that four? Okay. Yeah, we have 36 right. more to go before we're satisfied. I've talked to artists that have said they kind of have to paint in silence. Oh, your work, it has a lot of gestural elements. So I could see dancing a little bit. I'd say that depending on which phase of the, the piece we're in, the, the diptych that I was showing you is in the, the penciling stage. And sometimes, you know, especially with the level of detail that I work in, it, it can really just stretch the brain to really, you know, when you're trying to line up tufts of fur going down the musculature of, of any creature's back, or when you're, you're looking at a source photo and trying to kind of line up these tiny little strands of hair and these tiny little movements in the same place in the image where I'm working and then kind of as you're laying the feathers, I don't think I need to try to make it photo accurate with what, what I'm looking at, but I, I like to do that because I don't know, I just, I like to honor the life that I'm representing to kind of get that stuff to line up. It's really kind of almost makes your head hurt to, to micro focus into these like really small sections, trying to get them right. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit less freeing, but once I move kind of past that phase and it's a little bit more of the, then I, that ink over it. And then there's a little bit more of my own input going into there that's that's where I like to physically break free because I spend some of it really hunched over and tight and controlled and then I think sometimes the music I'm listening to you know and, and sometimes I'll listen to podcasts as well changes depending on which phase of the piece I'm in because it doesn't have to be one method for everything I think one of the hard transitions is finishing a piece which can be some of the free like that last stretch could be so freeing you know because you're so much of the work is done, you're, you're touching things up. As I'm getting into like the final stretch of coloring, you know, there's a lot of broad movements. And then when you go from that level of freedom and expression to starting over, and then there's a lot more control and tightness again. I don't, that's a rough transition, transition sometimes. And so the prose within your actual life inspired the recent piece. Yep. And I recall we talked about before your dog had inspired your wolf drawings. I would say my dog, yeah, influenced that wolf. They look very similar. Look at kimchi and draw from her, but her presence seeped into that wolf. So is there anything kind of in the back of your mind that might become the next piece? I have a good handful of pieces that are, that are really excited to get out right now. If anything, that's what's pushing like that urgency for me to finish what I'm currently working on so I can get to those. Seems like a, like a healthy push to finish something. I think earlier we referred to that as, you know, externally imposed deadlines, right. but the internal push for like that queue of animals that are, are in the queue of spirits that are wanting to be seen and expressed and, and, and worked with. I think that drives me as much as anything. If you could time travel anywhere past present, future, there are no rules. Do you know where you would pick? Oh man. You know, you mentioned we'd get here um, before we started recording and I had a different idea then than, than when you asked me now. The first thing that popped in my head now 
but actually be going into the future. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe, I don't know exactly when, but far enough down the line to just kind of see the after effect of life, the time, you know, we're living in such impactful times on, on all the different fronts that we're facing. I would love to see how a lot of this plays out. I'm so curious. And I, I tend to have a lot of faith in us as people and us as even a country, you know, I think we zig and zag and take some steps forward and take some steps back, but I am an optimistic person. And so I would like to see what are we talking here? 50 years, 100, 150 years or something? I'd I'd love to see how our times are thought of by future generations. And I'd like to see what the choices we made, what the impact of that is. I mean, these times, they I Mm -hmm. will certainly be in the history books. They will be in the history books. Say maybe you could go back in time to a certain artistic movement or- You know, artistic movements of the 50s and 60s, I'd kind of really curious about what they look like like even like the beat movement i'd be really curious to see what that looked like when it was happening you know especially with the the juxtaposition with their rebellion against a little bit more conformist society you know i'd love to see that play out be fun to catch a drink with some of them but definitely not go on the multi-week benders that they went on salvador dali and would love to see him in action the different periods of the classics throughout history and the renaissance era the raphaelite era and all of the different artistic movements i think would be hard to pick any one of those so i'll I'll stick with my initial answer of 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 recent history so it had come up on a recent episode when when talking about time travel that perhaps just even music and art can kind of take you there maybe you listen to an album you haven't listened to in 10 years or whatnot and oh yeah it's not actually transporting through time but it but it's kind of a form of time travel sure i agree with that and i thought that was interesting yeah i love that when you when you hear a song you haven't heard in a long time and it transports you to that era of your life i love that experience it doesn't have to be as out there as it sounds like flash forward to to now there's been this whole NFT <laughs> on fungible token. Non fungible tokens. Basically, the art equivalent to cryptocurrency. Mm-hmm. It's kind of this wild thing where it's been going on for a while, but it's entered the spotlight recently with that, that Christie's auction. And a lot of people still don't even quite understand what they are. Some people are kind of going all in on that. It's it's an interesting new platform for artists. And as we have just looked through your studio at all of the physical objects, all of the materials, I'm just curious what, what your thoughts are. NFTs, man. And I think I first heard about them was somewhat earlier this year. Someone else told me about them in a way where it's like, this is what you need to do. It's the next big thing. I have a weird relationship with that sentiment in general. It's kind of like, oh, here's the next thing that you need to do. I sometimes, I don't know if this is good or bad, but I have a knee-jerk reaction not to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but even when I get past that knee-jerk reaction, my, my feeling ends up remaining the same where, how do I put this? I, I always try to walk this line between not having my head in the sand and maybe not being stubborn, but, but also listening to myself and being true to myself. And you, you, know, you walk in that whole thing. So sometimes I'll miss the boat on something because I, I resist change or I resist a trend or something. So when it comes to this, I did look into them, you know, a bit and, you know, really try to wrap my head around what that would mean for, for me and and other artists in the art community. And even though there's people, you know, like Beeple and, and, and the Christie's auction that you mentioned, you know, are, are going to the moon with it. And this idea that there's people that have made all this money with crypto, especially young people. And personally, I have to go back to my own motivations and the only reason I would want to get aboard that is because they're saying you can make a killing off of it. Mm-hmm. You're off, just take off. And I do like the idea of there being a ledger and there being the original creator of the content getting a kick of the, getting a piece, a percentage in perpetuity each time it changes hands. Mm-hmm. But then to actually take advantage of that, I mean, I don't know if any single piece of art I've sold has been resold. You know, I, I think everybody, all my collectors have bought it and kept it. And I don't know if someone's bought a print and didn't want it, they probably re-gifted it. I can't, I can't imagine someone putting a print of mine on an art auction or eBay at this stage. And, and so the only motivation I would personally have to get into an NFT would be to try to capitalize on it, which I don't think is the right motivation. 
-hmm. you know, to, to completely change the style of art that I'm doing to capitalize on a trend. You know, one could argue like, well, it could change your life. You know, if you auction off art for X amount of money, like, okay, it could, but how much would I have to change fundamentally what I do to, to, to chase that? It seems like people, the little I've looked into him, like it was kind of in line with what the way he works anyway. In terms of NFTs as a whole, like, I like the idea of it. I like the idea of what it could mean for their, you know, artists maintaining their rights long-term. It feels like it's a long way off, just like crypto. Like it could be our future, but really should we drop what we're doing and invest in it now? And there's still a lot of infrastructure to get around before that takes hold. And what do you think about that? I think just to chase something because it's new, the new hot thing isn't always the best path. Overall, I've just been kind of fascinated with the whole process. It's, it's been great for certain artists. Works for one person is not going to work for everyone else. Sure. Into it, most of what you read about are, are people who are selling pieces for super high dollar. And I've read that a lot of what's being sold and traded is maybe closer to $10, $20. Not to say I want to time travel into the future to see what happens, but I am curious to see what will happen in the future. To, like as you tied it into the time travel question, I would be curious to see if and how quickly or how long it takes for you know these revolutionary possibilities that they offer, you know, how long it takes for them to, to take hold. I mean, just the very notion that when you bring up crypto or you bring up an NFT and someone goes, what's that? Like no one has like a party line of explaining it really quickly, you know? Granted, I've never been around an expert who can just nail it, but I've never heard it explained when the group that I'm around doesn't start like pushing back and it becomes an, like not an argument, but like a debate around, you know, the viability of the whole thing. And like that alone to me tells me there's a lot of ways, a lot of ground to gain before this becomes something that's more widespread. It's kind of at that weird phase where it's they've been around for quite some time, actually, but a lot of people still don't really understand what they are. One thing I will say that I am into is like you were saying, if if you did create one and it did get traded multiple times, the fact that, you know, that was yeah. trackable, whereas as you mentioned, you're not going to know about that with your paintings and prints, but it could also be that that's happening more often because that's kind of part of the nft thing that's a little bit what i was alluding to these memes that, and gifts that people are creating like hotcakes it's it's it, it it's its own thing i'm not sure how a piece of art that i create i guess if it did pinball around that'd be cool but mm -hmm. i you know i'd have to sit here and kind of really retool the direction i'm moving in to like make something that's appealing to that world maybe we can submit this episode as an nft that is an actual thing. Mm -hmm. We could submit this as an NFT and then see anybody buys it. <laughs> right. We'll auction it off as episode 40. Yeah. Sponsored by. I'll hit up Mickey's. Ask them if they want to get into the NFT game. Yeah. There you go. Episode 40. We did it. How Man, I've been slacking. I had to talk a lot. So I'm only here. That, that's okay. It's not, it's not a race. Time goes quickly. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you would like to hmm. talk about? A lot of my journey has been internal these days, and I actually think I'm better for it. I'm happier with the quality of my work and like just kind of the, it's, it's inherent characteristic energy, vibration, all of those things. Not to say I feel like a different person, but I feel like I've had a lot of time to really examine aspects of life that I was too busy to look at before. Seems like you're saying kind of a similar. 100%. The idea that, that as the world opens up, we don't go, well, that was nice. And then you go back to what you were doing. I think I'm not here to tell anybody what they should be doing, nor does it, nor, nor would they do it if I try to tell them. But right. I, I think that we would be missing a lot of the point of what we learned during this last year and a half if we just said, well, that was cool. I know how to make sourdough bread now and then go back to the rat race. You know, you can always make more money, but you can't buy your time back the last summer before things get back to normal in theory and so you know there's a, a chance to be with my family members more and do all the things that I don't normally get to do because I'm usually gone most of the year and it's incumbent upon us to really choose for ourselves I've heard other people saying like they're getting a little bit overwhelmed with all the there's so many social engagement now there's so many things going on like they're feeling a little bit burnt out like it's up to you to moderate that and we've also learned so much more about ourselves I don't think we need as many things externally to fill our cups the way we thought we did. As a matter of fact, we were running on 
low batteries and, and kind of being drained in a lot of crucial areas, fundamental areas that it would be a shame if we overlooked them going forward in our lives. Let's make it better, right? Yeah, I agree. You know, when I found Dexter the fledgling, that changed my whole afternoon and I had things to do that day. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I was like, but this is what I'm going to be doing now. I actually thought about it. I'm like, do I have time to do this? And the other thought was, where, where else am I besides in front of this, you know, wounded fledgling? So little things like that kind of, I don't want to not be able to do that. I don't want to see a wounded bird on the road and be like, well, that sucks. I got a meeting to get to and then keep going, you know? I hear that. Well, do you have any shout outs? I want to shout out to Ann Kelly Aww. for doing her 40th episode. You've been going and doing Thank all these you. interesting interviews and having your, your, you've expanded your uh, repertoire over these last 40 episodes. I can only imagine. That is definitely true. When I started this last summer, when I hit you up, I wasn't sure where this was going, but I, I'm not finished yet. No, I yeah, episode 40 and, and not the last episode. So not the last episode. Yeah. And I want to shout out to all the artists and creatives. Won't name any names. I'll just say all the people who have spent more time with their craft and learned lots more about themselves during this period. Inspiring artists who have, who have had a chance to really dig their heels in into what they want to do and established artists who have had to switch gears and learn new things about themselves and reinvent themselves. I really, 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 from the bottom of my heart, hope that we're able to treat ourselves better, live better. There's an artistic renaissance coming on the heels of all of this. There already has been one during COVID. And I wish nothing but the best to the whole of us because I think creativity can be our salvation. And I feel like I mentioned something about that in our last episode seven. But I, I, um, I really, 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 really want hope that people are able to take that creative sides of themselves that they they accessed more of during COVID and and really lean into it. So shout out to um, and all of us. Thanks for spending time with my studio. And and your Instagram handle is at Roner Art R O H N E R A R T. And your website Ronerart.com. Consistent. So check him out on there. Check me out at Ronerart.com. Grab yourself a original mini totem if you like one of these big original pieces email me we can talk we can get it to you and have them hanging on your wall and you can travel back to episode seven Mm -hmm. and check that out as well it was a whole different time period i had an afro you had a bob we were different (laughs) people cheers cheers Thank you for watching episode 40 of Art in the Raw. I hope you enjoyed the studio tour with artist Michael Rohner. If so, please do us a solid and like, comment, subscribe, and tell your friends. Episode 40. Have a good night, y'all.